Okay. Um, since we do not have a chair yet, the meeting is starting <laughs> at 10.03. I will never do this again. Um, okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, I My name is Vanessa Burgess, General Counsel for Trek. I think I have talked to everyone here, and I know I have at least emailed with everyone on the other side, if not spoken. Um, so welcome to the first ever in the history of time meeting of the Broker Responsibility Advisory Committee. Woohoo! Woo. Well, we'll go down as the first ever members of this committee. So fame. Mm -hmm. um, so I do, um, before we get started, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping in terms of, uh, because we've got both a virtual and a um, physical in-person presence. Uh, and I, I tend to cover this every single meeting. So some of you have heard me say this before. Um, so if you are in the room, that is our microphone right there, that round thing. Um, and it picks up sound very well sometimes too well. Uh, so what I will say is if you are talking in the room, like if you're saying something as a member, just speak normally. Um, we, have, we actually have to keep it up. But thank you. Um, but the um, it, it'll pick up your voice just fine. Sometimes if you're at the end of the table or like where Kelsey's sitting back there, you may have to speak up a little bit. She's like, I'm not going to speak. Um, <laughs> but she's just my example. Um, but generally, it picks up pretty well. Now, you know what it's really good at picking up on? Side conversations. Like, it is excellent at picking up side conversations. So uh, be mindful of that, just because it kind of interrupts the meeting. Um, but I always like to give that warning, and it's usually my side conversation that it picks up. Um, but it will pick up side conversations. Now, for everyone who is here virtually, um, we do ask that if you are on the committee that you have your camera on. Um, and uh, if you, you, everybody looks like they're muted right now. So the best practice is to stay muted unless you are actively speaking. And that is because inevitably it is your neighbor's lawn day or whatever it is, right? Um, and it will pick that up. So it really helps with the background noise. That said, um, you are a member, so feel free to unmute and, and speak as you would as if you were here, right? Um, if you don't love doing that because uh, that's not really your style or whatever, you think it'd be easier to do it a different way, there is a little button on this screen. It's down um, in the bottom. On my screen, on my computer, it's up at the top, so I don't know. Um, but it looks like a hand, and you can push the button, and it will raise your hand, and it will tell us that your hand is raised. You also have to unraise your hand. So you push it again once you've uh, talked, or if you decide, yeah, no, I'm not going to say that thing I was going to say. Um, and uh, if not, we'll we'll tend to call on you again, and then you'll say, oh, I forgot to raise my hand. And it happens at every meeting, so that's okay. Um, but you can feel free to use the raise hand function. If your hand has been raised for a little bit and no one has said anything, um, we try and keep an eye on it. Sometimes that's hard. Just feel free to unmute and, and speak up. Okay. That is the housekeeping. Um, what we will do um, now, agenda item three is a welcome. And I think this will be particularly important for this group um, because it's our first meeting, right? Um, and normally it would be the chair that does this, but you're stuck with me. So we um, chatted about this. I've introduced myself. I think we've all communicated, um, you know, like I said, but uh, I will be, one of your primary contacts on this group. So um, I'm very happy to see everyone here. I think this seems like a really neat group. Um, and with that in mind, uh, I was gonna pass it over to Chelsea Buckles, who's our executive director, and she's gonna do um, some staff introductions. And then after that, I thought we would go around and everybody introduce themselves and where they're from um, and, you know, just a little bit about who you are. It doesn't have to be, I'm not gonna ask you to like name one, you know, strange thing about you or anything, but just like a little bit of an introduction yeah, that yeah. we can um, 
just one. Get to know each other. Yeah, yeah it's too hard. Uh, so with with some, they've got so many. So mm -hmm. no icebreakers then. No icebreakers. The ice is broken. We're here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, welcome. I'm Chelsea Buckholz. I'm executive director for Trek and now also executive director for the appraiser board, TALCB. I used to be the commissioner there and they have switched the name so that I have the same title in both places. It seems very efficient. Um, so that was a January 1 legislative change that we very easily implemented. This was the implementation right here. I've, I've announced. <laughs> um, I wanted to, well, first of all, uh, broker Responsibility Advisory Committee. We've had a lot of discussion on what we call, y'all, is it BRAC? Is it BRAC? What a, you know, how, what's going to flow off the tongue? We'll see how it all turns out. But I'm really excited to get this group started. It's not the first, of course, of its kind in the sense that we have had groups who are looking at broker responsibility issues. And many of you have been involved with that. But um, making it a an official advisory committee, I think, is a great step, and I think it conveys what needs to be conveyed, which is this is a really important work. Um, we there's a tension related to broker responsibility. Uh, that's the same tension related to our mission, right? We we encourage the economic growth within the state of Texas uh, through our license holders, and we protect the consumer. There's there's tension there. Um, part of that is to constantly raise the bar on that professionalism. And I think among the industry, you hear a lot about that. Every, you know, the person on the other end of the table is not good at what they do. You know, we hear a lot about that, but we cannot do that um, in such a way that it creates a barrier to entering this type of work, right? Um, that would be kind of anti-competitive in nature. We want to encourage whoever would like to get into this industry to be able to do so around with the appropriate parameters. We have some of the highest requirements to enter the profession um, among the entire country. Um, we have a higher requirement for education and we our standard is quite high. And so the question is, how do we continue to manage this population, part of the answer, a big piece of that answer, is through broker responsibility. I don't think there's any silver bullet on broker responsibility. I think we've been looking for it for a long time. But one thing that Vanessa and I talk a lot about is just this incremental improvement. There's, If there's not going to be a silver bullet, then what can we do to just improve today? And we're, you know, government is slow as molasses. Um, we and, and that's intentional. That's so that all of the players involved in the process can be uh, a part of the process. Um, if we were to move fast, then we would lose something in that. Um, so I, I'm not just trying to justify our slowness, um, but more than anything to kind of explain a piece of that. Um, I want to introduce our staff. I'm always accessible. Um, I, my work phone forwards to my cell phone. So if you ever need anything, just holler. But there are um, like everybody in our agency knows more than I do. So I want to make sure that you know who to go to if you really need like actual help. Because <laughs> that's who I go to for actual help. Um, of course, you all know Vanessa Burgess, our general counsel. We have Abby Lee, our deputy general counsel. They are quite the pair. We have Denise Sample, our Director of Licensing. We have Jen Wheeler, Jennifer Wheeler, Director of Education and Examination Services. Did I say that right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it's long. We have Mike Sample Deal over here behind Marion. He works in our Education and Education and Examination Services Education. Division. Education. Yeah. Education. <laughs> um, let's see, we have um, Mike over here, Malloy who's our Director of Enforcement, so all things discipline, discipline related. We have Tony Slagle, Deputy Executive Director. I'm going to let you introduce yourself here in a minute, Texas Realtors. Um, we have Amber over here. Amber um, handles a ton of our logistics and knows literally everything. So she's a great starting point. And then we have several on the screen. Crystal Stowell is in our Education Division. 
Um, and then we have, let's see, Sierra Pizarro and Summer Mandel, the bottom, they make up our um, communications division. So they will keep track of what is discussed in this room and then report that out to people. They also um, manage our social media. They work on videos that go to our uh, education courses, um, anything related to kind of external relations they handle and are doing quite well. Have I missed anybody? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think next we wanted to introduce all of the committee members. Remember, you do not need to say, you just say whatever you want to say. We'll start in the room and then we'll go online and then we'll introduce other visitors in the room. Does that sound good? Okay, you first. Marvin Jolly from Plano, Texas. Ty Williams from Fort Worth, Texas, Arlington, Texas, and Dallas, Texas, depending on the day. <laughs> we'll call you the Metroplex. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Um, I, I'm Rena Cami from Houston, Texas. Mary Napoleon, Dallas, Fort Worth, Metroplex. Uh, uh, Brian Sales, I'm in the uh, Midland Odessa market and in the Fort Worth area. Ashley Conlon, DFW and Waco. Okay. We've got, um, I'm just going to at random how I see you call it. Um, so starting with numbers first, we've got CME. Yep, Sammy Scogg, and I'm from Beaumont, Texas. We have got Mike. Mike Mingdon, Houston, Texas. We've got Larry. Larry Frawley, Houston, Texas. By the way, I'm in Phoenix at a convention a little warmer than you all, so. Uh, <laughs> you're very jealous of this. Um, and then we've got uh, two commissioner liaisons here today, um, out of both of whom are... Um, <laughs> Former former members. I should have said we've got Bob Baker here, who's our alternate member, um, who I know will be a very active alternate member, and I'm happy about that. Um, and then so we've got for commission liaisons, we've got Commissioner Lerner. You want to say hello? Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited you're there. I'm usually there with you, and I will be in the future. Um, you have big shoes to fill. We have done such a great job over the past years, and I think. You're the team to keep it going. And then we've got Commissioner. Hey, good morning, everybody. Excited to be here. Excited for this group to get working. Um, and I will just sit here silently and judge you. From <laughs> <laughs> he said it. <laughs> uh, OK, did I get everybody? Yes, I think so. OK, so this is it. This is the group. I'm going to now do. Um, Hold on, just a second. Oh, what did I do? Yes. We have two visitors in the room. Will y'all oh, want to introduce sorry. yourselves? No, I'm Kelsey Vanderbilt. I'm associate counsel in Texas Rolls. Awesome. Thank you, Kelsey. I'm Carmen Williams, uh, future broker, wife of Ty Williams. <laughs> <laughs> and fellow Costco lover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get away from Costco. Right. Uh, that's what we share. Uh, okay, so I will now put my cup of tea down and do all the things I need to do to make this advisory committee training PowerPoint share and work. Uh, okay, so I present Kansas. Present. Look at that. <clears throat> okay. You did it. Look at this. This is huge improvement for me, Zach, everybody. <laughs> um, okay, so I wanted um, whoever, I want to give a little bit of an intro on this, and I want to first and foremost apologize to those who have been in all of the prior meetings where I've done this training because it's your third time hearing it in the last week. Um, and it's, it's just a tiny bit different. Um, but we started this last year, which is uh, an advisory committee training that we do at the first meeting of each calendar year, um, often because we've got new members here. You know, boy, do we ever have new members. Um, and, and also, I think it's a, it's a good reminder of, you know, who is the commission? Um, what is this committee? What's it charged with doing? How does it work? Um, I think a lot of times... Uh, 
you know, you come into these groups and if you haven't served before, you don't know, right? You don't know necessarily the interplay between statutes and rules and who's what, um, why, you know, why are we here? Why isn't it just the committee members, things like that. Um, so we'll walk through all that. I will do my very best to not make this too long or too boring, although it will likely be too long, but not boring. Uh, okay, so first let's talk about the Texas Real Estate Commission, right, which is your regulatory body, because everyone in here is a broker, uh, member, right? We don't have um, any any other types. Some of our committees have like multiple member types that come with different roles um, in that regard. But let's look first at the commission. So TREC exists to safeguard the public interest and protect consumers of real estate services, right? We are a consumer protection agency um, and we do so through education, we do it through licensing and making sure that those who receive license, licenses meet the requirements for licensure um, and enforcement. Uh, so for those who commit violations of license laws um, or enforcement also has a big role. Um, they do uh, the criminal background component of things at renewal and that initial application. Um, and so through those, di th those divisions, um, and actions, I guess, the agency ensures the availability of qualified and ethical service providers, which, as Chelsea just mentioned, thereby facilitates economic growth and opportunity across Texas. I think we all know that real estate is a big deal in Texas, right? Um, and so the way in which the commission can achieve its mission of facilitating economic growth is to ensure that we have competent license holders who meet the requirements under statute, um, we have a system for enforcing those who don't, and we have an opportunity to uh, not only approve education, make sure the courses are being done correctly, but also we um, have a role in some of those education courses too. The one that comes to mind, Legal One Two, be our broker uh, responsibility course, things like that. Um, so, who is the commission? So, the commission consists of nine members. They're all appointed by the governor. Um, so six members are brokers and they bring the industry side of things, right? They have to have had a certain amount of experience. Um, often this has to be, uh, has to have been their major occupation for the five years preceding appointment, which, um, I'm not sure I've seen anyone at five years. Often they've, they've got a significant amount more. Um, and then we've got three members who represent the public and, um, I just noticed that error, uh, who bring the public consumer perspective to the commission. So public members are really there to serve as truly a member of the public. And what would what would the public's interest be in the work that the commission is doing, right? Um, and some of our committees also have public members. This one does not, um, and that is because this is really, uh, the focus here is going to be broker responsibility and, um, and those areas of focus, but you will have that public consumer side in your recommendations through rulemaking process and through um, any recommendations that go to the commission also have those public. So the driving force of the commission is consumer protection, and we will say it all day long in these meetings, um, which is, you know, what's the, what's the consumer protection side of this? Um, and that's really important because that's that's who the agency is charged with protecting. And I think from your standpoint, these are your clients, right? Um, so all of the policy making decisions of the commission uh, center on concepts of consumer protection and then that facilitation of economic growth and opportunity throughout the state. Okay, so what is an advisory committee? Um, well, you're on one, so. I know. Um, no, it's uh, an advisory committee or committees of stakeholders who meet to address relevant issues in the real estate industry. Um, and these committees make recommendations to the full commission. I'm going to walk through what that looks like in just a little bit. Um, but that includes recommendations related to rulemaking and other policies. Um, so not all of all the recommendations are necessarily rules. Sometimes there's a recommendation to, you know, put something in um, in the education materials, look at this or that, or at least consider certain things when doing so. And I'm going to walk through that process in just a little bit. Brian actually sent me a great email on um, what he thought was super important for new members to know and for um, 
you know, the way that he breaks down when we're looking at a topic, how he thinks of it. And um, it was really music to my ears, Brian. Okay. So, ah, look at that. That's shameful. Um, I switched it last night, so I'm, I'm sorry. The BREC, which was previously the BRWG, um, I had it flipped and now, okay. Uh, this is why I shouldn't make last minute edits. So previously the BRWG, the Broker Responsibility Working Group, which um, essentially functioned as an advisory committee, but it didn't have the standing rules and it wasn't a standing committee. It served um, at the, the will of the chair. Um, and now, as we all know, it's a standing advisory committee. You've got terms, there's um, rules tied to that. And um, it won't just be sort of a, oh, when we think we need it. Though it hasn't been that, I will say, in the last few years. Um, so it's historically been a group dedicated to making recommendations related to broker responsibility issues in advance of legislative sessions. Um, it is now a group that makes recommendations related to broker responsibility all the time. Um, but in, in particular, in advance of legislative sessions is important because um, if a change requires a legislative change, um, getting in a recommendation timely is really helpful. Um, and I say that, and it always seems like the, the next session is coming. It's already here, basically. It's over, right? And it's not, but it feels that way because the amount of prep that goes in to um, just legislative session in general is so much, and then there's implementation and things like that. Um, but we always try and keep the timing. We try and be mindful of... Um, the legislative session. So I will say this, um, your role on this, so you're all broker members, right? Your role as a member of this group um, does actually require you to think about your industry a little bit differently than you probably typically do, right? Um, and this is a question that the Chair Kesner um, posed to me, uh, like this is the way that he phrases it, and I think it's a really helpful way, which is, um, which hat are you wearing when you come to these meetings? Are you, uh, you know, Ty Williams broker and I'm here to make sure that my business runs better and I make more money and uh, no one else can become uh, a broker because I'm going to get all the clients? I like that you're nodding your head with that. No, I mean, I'm yeah. 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 So today is showing his true colors here, everybody. Uh, I'm kidding. And I routinely give Ty a hard time. And uh, I think I mean, he keeps coming back. So I think he's going for fun. So, uh, you know, is it that or are you wearing the hat of consumer protection? And you're kind of taking yourself a little bit out of your business needs. But, you're, but what you're seeing out there in your business, in your industry, you've also got to bring with you because you know what's happening, right? You know in a way that we do not because we are not out there. Um, and, and that's what makes you really the, you know, such a key stakeholder on our end is you're out there, you know what's happening. Um, and you went through this process to serve on the committee. And so we know that you're coming here. Um, it's, it's an act of service, right? That's what you're doing here. Uh, and and we appreciate that, but it's always important to remember that component of it. And this is how I, I give the example, which is if you have an idea and you're like, it would do this, 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 and this. Oh yeah, and consumer protection. Um, you probably want to think about that, right? Because no. you can kind of tag consumer. You you can make an argument on a lot of things, but are you are you really? Is that the purpose behind it? Um, so I think that's the that's really the what you want to bring to the table at each and every meeting, but don't disregard your experience and what you're seeing also, because that is, that's part of the reason you're here too, right? Yeah. I would add to that, Chelsea. Yeah. Also what I bring is my perspective in my business model. And I think that's really, I'm really excited about this group because it represents so many different business models and, and niches in the industry. So, so, so I think it's important for me, for me to be able to say, Here's my business model, and here's how what we're talking about affects this. But be open to uh, learning from so many different perspectives yeah. and business models. Yeah, I think you have made such a great point. And so I'm going to come up um, a little bit uh, in regard to business models. Um, you know, we talk a lot about um, sort of the makeup of our groups and making sure we've got folks who are representing different regions for some of our groups. 
in this group, um, I think you want some some regional difference, which we do, but uh, you also probably want difference in uh, types of brokerages that um, are being brought to the table here, right? Small, large, medium, all of that, um, and and the different models that come under some of those. And so that is that. I mean, that's it, right? That's what makes this a group that is really looking at the whole industry um, and not excluding certain uh, business models or, or types and really getting into that. Um, so this is my scary slide. Um, and I, I say this to everyone um, because it's it's hard for it not to come up sometimes in meetings, right? Um, so I just always say, so speaking in favor or against certain companies or business practices models, um, so you're a member of an advisory committee. These are open meetings. You all took that really exciting training. Um, the the recordings of these meetings go up on our website. Uh, and so everything that you say in this room, well, is, it lives forever. Um, I don't know if it lives forever, but it lives for a long time on our website. Um, and uh, you just want to make sure. So if you're speaking in favor, so if you're just saying, you know, gosh, I just love bro brokerage A. I just love them. They're the best. They can do no wrong. We should just do what they do. They're so great, et cetera. Um, that, can, that can create a perceived favoritism by the group. And this is a group that's making recommendations to the commission as a whole, um, huge policy decisions that impact the industry. So you don't want perceived favoritism. Uh, you also don't want the opposite of that, which is brokerage A is the worst. Their business models are trash. They're just trying to make a bunch of money. They don't even care about the consumer, et cetera. Because um, that also will create the opposite, which is the loss of trust. Um, and that's going to be on, on on both, actually. I'm sorry. You're going to have both loss of trust on either end of that um, by both the consumer and regulated industries. So, um, you know, especially when you think, oh, gosh, the BRAC, like they're the worst. All they care about is that one um brokerage model that they think is the worst, though it's my model and it actually works super well. And I don't know why they're always ragging on, you know, me or that or whatever. Um, so you want to think about that. And there's ways to talk about issues. And just, I, I will say that there's ways to talk about things um, where you don't need to specifically name anyone. Right. Um, sometimes I know that's hard because it's like, well, it's just that one group that's doing it. Um, but you don't need to bring names in. You can use, I just gave an example, right? It's what we do in the, um, our course books, you know, broker J, broker B. Um, and, and also just to be mindful of the conversations that you're having. And, you know, you may see just all the negative, but somebody else might see, oh, well, actually, you know, it works really well. And I've seen, I've seen it happen. Um, and so I just want you to be mindful of that because you are, these are public meetings and you are here to, um, to speak to everything. Doesn't mean you have to like everything. Um, and I think there's a way, and I know you can do it, to talk about the issues without calling out anyone specifically. Um, and then also, you know, speaking and probably more speaking against certain companies can bring you some legal issues because you're making statements, you're, you know, a stakeholder group that reports to the regulatory body, et cetera. And the worst part about this is I can't be your lawyer if you have legal issues. Um, so you are then on your own to get your own counsel I assume not fun. Um, okay, so what do we consider? Um, I think actually I'm going to start with my third bullet because this is this is something that Brian brought up to me, um, and then I'll I'll go back to to bullets one and two. Um, but something that he said that he didn't totally understand before he got here, which is fine. Um, I don't know that many people understand this. Um, you know, Marion, you've got some advisory committee experience, so I know you'll know this. But um, a lot of the recommendations that will come out of this group require uh, require rulemaking. So I want to talk just a tiny bit. I'm not not going to go like you know, hong kong is that what they say? Uh, but you've got like you've got chapter 1101, which is the section occupations code establishes the commission lays out the requirements. It's it's our governing statute for Trek, thus for your industry. Um, and so that, that chapter lays it all out. Sometimes it lays out requirements very specifically, and sometimes it 
it allows for a more general authority of the commission to have over certain aspects. We do have a general rulemaking authority, but it's got to be tied to, um, you know, tied back to statute, et cetera. But, but the things that allow us to implement the rules for our daily practice. So what is a rule? Um, for all intents and purposes for the regulated community, uh, a rule is a law, right? It's just that the, the creation of those, you know, mini laws or really just laws, the rules has been delegated to the regulatory body. Um, and that's because the regulatory body knows the ins and outs of the industry. It allows for the agency who's actually doing the thing, issuing the licenses, doing, the, you know, to, to set up processes that work, things like that. So that's what our rules are. But I think when I think about your daily practice, probably the rules matter more. You're more familiar with them than that big statute, um, which, you know, please read it. It's, it's lovely. Um, but I, I think the impact on the license holder really comes into play through the rules. And um, I'm going to walk through rulemaking process in one second. But basically what this group will do on a lot of things, um, I'm going to use the obligation to respond timely rule because that actually came out of the broker responsibility working group. Um, so um, there was this thought, hey, we should have a rule that requires brokers and agents to respond within two calendar days when it relates to um, an a ongoing transaction or transaction. I'm not saying it right, I'm sorry, um, but to a real estate transaction, there it is. Um, and so what happens there is, you know, the, the Abby really, Abby wrote the language, not in this meeting. She wrote it. She wrote the language. She brought it to a meeting of the broker responsibility working group because they had asked for it. Um, the group looked at it. They dissected it. There were questions. They made some edits. And then the whole group voted to recommend that rule for proposal at the next commission meeting. So let's say it was at the uh, January meeting. They took a vote. And that meant that at the February commission meeting, the whole commission meeting, um, uh, we got up, the attorneys got up and said, um, hey, we've got this new rule. This is what it says. It's recommended by the broker responsibility event at working group. We'll just say the broker responsibility advisory committee, um, which that carries some weight, right? Because that means that you all have dissected it. You've looked at the all ends from continuing protection, et cetera. And then the commission will take a vote as to whether to propose that rule. Okay, so let's say they say, yes, we love that rule put it out for proposal. So then what's going to happen is right after that February meeting, we are going to publish it to the Texas Register and probably more relevant to everyone here. It's gonna go on our website. And you, There's a 30 day comment period where you can say what a great rule or this is a terrible rule and this is not clear and this is not clear. And why are you even doing this? Um, and so we'll take all of those comments for 30 days. And then when this group would meet again in April, right, because we're going on that calendar system. So it's proposed at February, comment period closes, meet in April. This group gets to walk through every single public comment received. And um, you can make some changes. We'll get into, I'm not going into details on substance changes, et cetera, but like this group will look at it, they'll look at all the comments and they may say, you know what, we didn't think about this, we're gonna pull it, we, we don't recommend to go for adoption or they'll make some changes or they'll say, you know what, I see their point, but the consumer protection component outweighs it. This is really needed, let's move forward. Um, and so then the, co the, the committee will again vote. They'll vote to recommend for adoption, go before the full commission. If the commission likes it, they will vote for that adoption and it will become a rule like a law and that's it, it's happening. It's, it's real, it's live, right? So that's pretty significant. That's significant work um, on the part of an advisory committee um, but that's the majority of your recommendations typically end up being a rule change. And it can also be just a change to an existing rule. I'll give the example of a new rule because it's um, easier and it's on my brain. Um, so things we consider in the rulemaking process, um, and we included this in your materials. So we've got that letter from 2019 asking, uh, it's from the governor's office, asking licensing agencies to reduce barriers to entry. Um, through a couple of different mechanisms, right? Um, I think criminal history is really touched upon in that letter, issuing probationary licenses versus denying 
um, essentially getting folks back to work um, after they have, um, I don't want to say served their time, but I can't think of a different way to say that. Um, but um, they've done what's been asked of them, right? And that doesn't, um, you know, that doesn't happen just, okay, you're done, like you did it and you're good, so you get a license from us. Like they've got to meet our license requirements. There's a whole process um for for that system and looking at mitigating factors etc but i know the governor focuses on that he also focuses on the second thing which is a, a general reduction in barriers to entry right so we don't um we don't want to make it harder to get a license unless there's a reason to increase some sort of requirement right um, and sometimes there are reasons to do so um and so we just want to be mindful, though, that we have generally been asked, well, not just pretty specific, but been asked to reduce barriers to entry. Um, and so anytime we want to increase a requirement to raise something, and it sometimes it seems like, gosh, that didn't even seem like that's what that was doing, but it is. Um, we've got to be mindful of that. We've got to tie back to the statute that allows us to do so. We need to tie back to data showing that this is an issue and that we're trying to resolve it. Right. Um, and so you will hear me often being like, hey, don't forget. Um, and I, I do that uh, with the intent of helping, not not dissuading. Um, just want to have that. We've also got this regulatory compliance division. I'm not going to go into the whole spiel about it, but essentially if the agency wants to pass a rule that potentially affects the marketplace, meaning, um, you know, it could potentially prevent folks from um, like a little bit of an antitrust situation. Like if it's going to make it so that just that certain people can do things, this case comes out of a North Carolina case where there were, there was a dental board um, made up of dentists similar, right? To what you have in the commission and they didn't like these uh, teeth whitening kiosks at the mall. They didn't like them because it was taking away business from them not so much because it was an issue as it relates to like consumer protection, dental, I'm going to just generically say dental requirements because I could not tell you what a dental requirement is other than to brush twice a day um, and it's lost. Um, so the regulatory compliance division um, is a section of the governor's office that was created as a result of that North Carolina case because that case was a big deal nationwide. Um, and so this group, if there's a rule that we put out for proposal that has the potential to impact the marketplace, they get involved. So we send it to them. Um, they often ask us for data. Um, sometimes even if we propose something that we didn't think necessarily was doing that, they'll reach out to us and say, hey, this might do that. Can we take a look at X, Y, and Z? Or this does seem like it's doing that. So please, you know, send us everything that we need and if something is with regulatory compliance division we cannot adopt it until they have signed off on it and and that's a that's a layer of consumer protection right there um so um you'll you'll hear me say don't forget about regulatory compliance um we need the data we're always saying we need the data we need to show that like, is this a problem or is this this happened three times but it seemed really big um, and sometimes those things can, you know, are not usually exclusive, but or the, sometimes the data just isn't there, even though anecdotally, you know, it should be right. There's just no way to measure. Yeah. And that's hard. That's a, that I think is a real hard one. Um, so, OK, we're at the end of this training, but I think um, this will be really helpful uh, in, also in terms of starting conversation. In this group, though, um, I, I would be surprised if it's hard to start conversation in this group. Um, but we've got to look at that. I even changed the method up there. Hire BRWG members. I've just moved into the current day. It's not BRAC. So for those who were on the BRWG, we've got um, two here and we've got an alternate. Um, why did you choose to continue to serve? And what did you learn during your time on the BRWG? Look, I got it right there. I mean, for, for me, I think um, what I learned is the ins and outs of the commission, what we can and cannot do. Um, but I think that what I learned is if you put your mind to something, you can really get some things done that need to be done and accomplished. 
And I think bringing together a diverse group like we have now is really the key to getting um, some things accomplished that really need to be done and looked at and examined. And I think that what really kept me going in this was the motivation and the level of insight and communication that everyone had together. We had a pretty close knit group and everybody really worked together to get things done. And that's what I'm really looking forward to in this group for all of us to come together and get some things done and talk about them and be open minded. So one thing is some of us would come in and be like, this is this is really needs to happen. And then we'd get into discussion and we'd flip and we'd be like, you know what? Maybe we need to really look at a different different light in different way. And maybe this is really going to impact some things in a negative light or it's going to be a huge impact in a positive way. And getting the insight from the inside uh, with us as brokers on the field and then from the outside with uh, the commission and our friends here really does make it where it's possible to get the things done that we need to get done. And I'm just really excited. What really motivated me to come back is I feel like we got a lot more to do and I've got a whole list of them. So I can't wait to share. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. Brian's here with me, too. Ah, thanks, so. Ty. I'm, I'm excited you're here. Yeah, too. it's a lot of fun. Um, what I learned, and, and Chelsea pro covered some of it, is the tension between not creating barriers to entry, but the real feeling and, and desire to raise the bar on professionalism. And, and I think that is our responsibility and that is our charge is how do we how do we raise the bar on professionalism? And I think all the members here will agree that that's that really needs to happen in our industry. And and how do we do that without without creating barriers to entry? And what I learned was incremental change. I mean, it's hard to change a rule. And Chelsea just described the process of changing a rule. But it's really hard to change a statute, and uh, and we and in our working group we made some recommendations for statutory changes, particularly with regard to education uh, for brokers. That was that was mandated by statute, and I think what was changed was now uh, that's subjected now down into the rulemaking authority, which has really given us an opportunity to have an impact in the industry with regard to raising the bar on professionalism. I think my agenda four or five years ago was the edu education requirements for broker license, if you don't have a bachelor's degree, is is on, not on a level playing field with somebody who has a bachelor's degree, and, and can we and can we fix that? Well, we made a big step forward in that, in, in that change. And so, as Ty said, we have some unfinished business. And, and I think that's what, what motivated me to, to come back. And and also just the uh, how much I learned, you know, just from from the other members and, and the other experience. And and that's why I'm really excited about the breadth of our experience and, and business models and that, that we've got in this group. So that's great. Um, One other thing I learned. Please. And and we kind of struggled through it in the working group and we talked about uh, different topics and towards the end of that discussion, we, we kind of had this, well, what do we do now? And and I think what we learned was it, it's going to it really requires us to let's all agree on on this, that at the end of discussing a topic, it either dies. We we're not going to we're not going to deal with this topic anymore or we're going to make a recommendation to the commission for or for proposal or we're going to ask for more information you know so we define what the outcomes are so that at, we can be more effective and efficient in just the way that we run the meetings and moving just moving forward with how we proceed yeah and i will tell you this is another side note to piggyback off of what you said we'll get information from you guys and you've got like the stockpile of other discussions that had happened in the past and we can tap into those because a lot of the time we found that it saved us time and like oh this is what they already did hey why reinvent the wheel you know so i don't know i'm just i'm thankful as well and i think yeah. really good points Brian. yeah and bob baker who is our alternate member miss you bob with the working group for a long long time and and 
I don't want to say how long because it <laughs> might embarrass me. <laughs> but but uh, just that that wealth of knowledge and, and historical information is really really important. You know, one thing you said made me think of something, and I think it's a little bit counterintuitive, and that is that as a regulatory body, part you know, there's this desire, and it's not wrong, to raise the bar of professionalism, but as in the in, within the context of our regulatory position, like our role, our job isn't to require everyone to be amazing, right? It's to, to, to have that minimum threshold. So it, when I say that, you know, like the way I parent is very different. Like we're gonna be the best we can possibly be, right? Um, and in a lot of our professional world, that's how we want to be. But within this regulatory framework, our role is not to make them. It's we can educate and equip them, but we can't require them to be the very best. However, that's different than what like the trade associations do. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons why it's really co cool that Kelsey is here is that we work really well together. And what may not be the right thing for us to to do and rule maybe a great message for a texas realtors magazine or something you know so it doesn't mean that it can't happen it just means that we may need to think about it a little bit differently so um i think that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes and it it it's not a reason to avoid conversations but it's sort of something to keep in the back of your mind in terms of like of what our what our role is as a regulatory body in your video for broken responsibility, I mentioned that you, you talked about raising the bar on professionalism, but you also talked about the importance of our enforcement division. Right. And and one of the things that I became aware of early, early on was, you know, I thought I really felt like a if as a broker, if I wanted to make a complaint about another broker, that's really a trade association complaint. And consumers file their complaints with TREC. And what I became aware of, TREC really welcomes broker to broker or broker to agent complaints, but the industry is so reluctant to report on each other. And I think that's work that we can do in this in this committee as well, is just somehow encouraging that self-policing among, among members of the industry. That's great. Um, and, and I'll say, uh, so to, to tag on to what Chelsea said, you will often see me in these meetings saying, okay, but you know, is that a business decision or is that a regulatory issue? Because they're different, right? And there's a lot of room to make great business decisions that will raise professionalism, but is it a regulatory issue? Similarly, you know, we'll hear like, oh, the civil liability on that and, and as a regulatory agency, um not that's not our issue mm -hmm. right but uh but i i get that it is an issue but it's not an issue for this right for this group um and that's hard like it is hard to make that separation that's that hat conversation mm -hmm. right um and it doesn't mean that it can't be discussed i think that's the the point discussions can happen but when it gets down to the work of the group um it's really from that regulatory consumer protection standpoint um, the other thing that Brian said to me, and then I'm going to move um, to ask a new member something, so get ready, new members, um, is uh, Brian suggested a process wherein at the beginning of each discussion, we articulate what problem are we trying to solve, just something that a former member would say. Um, and we now say in all of our other meetings, like this is how we open every meeting. Like, what is the problem we're trying to solve? And about halfway through the item, we need to go back to, wait, what are we trying to solve again? Because it's real easy to have meandered off and to be, you know, sharing experiences, whatever. And all of a sudden we're not talking about the thing. We've forgotten what the problem is, right? Um, and then at the end, before you make a recommendation, okay, this was the problem we were trying to solve. And have we, have we done something to that effect or have, have we not? Um, and I think that's actually just like I said, we do that in our meetings now. It's a really helpful way to just always get back to the, the core objective. Okay, I'm going to ask one 
to two new members. Why did you cho choose to serve on the BRAC? And you can, yes, please. Yeah. Um, uh, Rena Cami, um, <clears throat> I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm really excited about it. What I began to notice, it took me about uh, two years to get a feel for my role and, and really just get through the learning curve. But once I did, what I was able to um, figure out from my perspective <clears throat> and the model that we have is that I have uh, statistically significant results that I can share to help the industry forward. Um, so, um, you know, my role as a managing broker, um, I, I'm hyper focused on, you know, agent engagement, education, and troubleshooting. So, when I say troubleshooting for their issues with their clients, um, I will see an average of, um, I have two days a week and an average of 30 tickets a day that I go through. And then when you times that, times two for the two days that I have broker responsibility. Um, it's 60 a week plus all the other messages I get from agents. So on, in, in an average week, I'll be dealing with 100 agent issues. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm beginning to see trends. And in looking at trends on a volume basis, um, it, it, it can really have it make a difference for everybody. You know, I, I'm seeing it just for myself and my role. But I'm like, holy moly, I can impact the industry with the amount of data that I just see on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I'm excited to bring is a very unique perspective. We are also very excited for that. Yeah. Um, I can see everybody's like, oh, yes, this that is, is great. Yeah, bring your spreadsheet. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, Mike. I am. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? OK. Um, I am. For those of you that know me, I've been a practicing residential property manager for 35 years. And uh, I opened my mouth about a year ago to one of your previous members and said, you know, complaints one, two, four, and five in numbers of complaints to the commission have to do with leasing and property management. How many property managers do you have on your committee? And they said, uh, none. <laughs> So that's when I said I've always been involved in, in enforcement and making things better. Uh, again, those of you that have that have known me, I've been on the forums committee at Texas Realtors trying to make their job easier for like three decades. And I just said there's things that have to be done. And I've also done hundreds and hundreds of sales, too. So I know that side of the business, too. But there's as we're becoming more of a renter nation, um, we see a lot of issues that people don't get training for. There's no training for anything that I do in pre-licensing classes. It just doesn't exist. And so, but a lot of people are now getting into this business. And I think with the changes in the economy right now, this year, right now, you're going to see a ton of people trying to step into my space that have been in sales agents, but now they're going to come into the leasing and management side just because of the economics of what's going on. And they're making some huge mistakes and anything we can do to, to to get them in better shape or get rid of the bad ones, whatever, you know, whatever it takes. Um, I'm all in for that. And that's that's one of the main reasons I I threw my hat in the ring to get on this. It is my first Trek committee, but um, and I've been on as Chelsea can say, I've been on, you know, Chelsea can say I've been on working with Texas Realtors for decades, but uh, this is my first attempt to do something at Trek, and I can't wait. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So hope we can do some good stuff this year. And no good say, no good deed goes unpunished, Sucker. I know. <laughs> I, was saying, uh, uh, I was speaking at Metro Techs last week, and I had someone come up, and they were all concerned about the, the obligation to respond timely rule, and they do property management. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, I was like, okay, I was like, I hear you. I, I you know, I, I know some of the areas we're going to look at. Um, I was like, let me tell you that uh, I don't know if you know Mike, and then that he's going to be on the show. And he's like, oh, okay, we're fine. Uh, <laughs> and he's like, oh, okay. that's great. Yep. Um, so he was like really excited to to see that that level of representation is happening at the advisory committee level. So that's yep. that, I think that's neat. Okay, Larry, I see your hand up. Yeah, I was going to say, well, like Mike, you know, I'm also a property manager. So now we got two of us in there. So property manager and, uh, and general brokerage. And my biggest reason to want to serve, of course, I think is, uh, you know, keeping the standards up. 
you know, even in my interview, I said I'm, I'm a licensed broker in a couple different states. And I'm proud to say that in Texas, you know, the even the entry level to get in is is high. I think it's a I think that's a great thing. I don't think we actually need any more maybe necessarily education to get in. I think I think the ongoing part, you know, in running a brokerage, I think that's a that's an important piece. And, and that's there, I think, really to protect the consumer. So I think for my my big word this year is is standards. Love it. Okay, anyone else? All right. Um, I think. Hold on. Okay, I'm going to wait. That's for a different issue. Um, the only other thing I'll say that I didn't um, cover here, and Larry, you probably want to unraise your hand um, unless you want to have your hand raised. Okay. Um, so why are, why am I here? Um, why, why is staff here, right? Um, and uh, I joke that it's because we are the fun police, um, <laughs> but that is not entirely true. So here's here's who's typically in these meetings. Um, Abby and myself are here. Um, a lot of that has to do with open meetings, which you all took the course in. Um, and you know that's how we get an agenda. We get it posted the right way so that we can have this meeting. Um, we also can answer different uh, sort of questions you might have during it. Is this a quorum? Is that what's happening? Um, but we're also here to provide insight. Um, there, I, I say this, and I know she hates it, but like no one knows the rules and statute better than Abby Lee. Um, I, you can ask her like a, a question of like, is there something that says this? And she's like, yes, five thirty-five four zero nine section, and it's it's amazing. Um, and so she's such a great resource to have. Um, but also uh, we're, we're here, we help draft some of the rules. Uh, like I said, I'm always going to be the one who's like, don't forget that regulatory compliance division or, hey, you know, legislative change does this and that. So we're here for that. Um, we often present uh, what we call hurdles to changes that, are, that need to be made or that you are not that need to be made, that you are wanting to make. And um, that is not because we are against anything unless it's like truly like, no, that's a hard no, we can't. We cannot make it so that Ty is the only one <laughs> who can have a broker license. <laughs> um, but uh, the, you know, we're, we're here to give you the hurdles. That's not to necessarily dissuade you. It's the, it's sort of the reality and the things that maybe you haven't thought about because we're bringing the perspective of the agency and how things actually work here and our charges from the governor, right? Um, and from our commission. I mean, our commission weighs in on things um, that, that are before this group. So um, that said, I want you to know that the reason I'm going to break my hurdles in these meetings is because if you make a recommendation as it relates to something, it's going to be workshopped by the full commission and I Never want to be in a situation where I just sat here and was like, yes, this is it. I'm not going to say anything. Cool. And then we get to workshop and I'm like, this is the worst idea. It breaks 17 laws. You can't do this. Our system will actually catch on fire if you try and do this. Um, things like that, right? So I just am always up front. That doesn't mean you can't make a recommendation. You are, you are yourselves. You're a committee. You vote. Um, but I just never want it to be a scenario where I didn't, I didn't raise the hurdles of concern. And uh, on that note, here are folks that are almost always here, right? We've got um, Denise Sample, Director of Licensing. Okay. Uh, she seems very important, right? Um, so you get your license. Um, but she can tell you what we do, what our processes are right now as it relates to licensing. She can tell you all the strange ways that our system works and how the relationships are. And she'll say a bunch of words. And I will nod my head. Um, but she, what Denise is really good at, often groups like this will say, well, if we could just add a checkbox to something oh, on yeah. our website, right? Yeah. Just, that, the checkbox tends to come up, and Denise will be like, well, in order to add a checkbox, we'll need to go to our vendor, and it'll take about six months and $20,000. By the way, the vendor that we're using, we will no longer use by the end of the fiscal year, because we have, you know, she can talk about like the actual implications to the checkbox um, because she's in the back end system all the right. time. So 
Yes. Similarly with education on the back. I mean, you know, everybody who works here kind of knows the back end side of things. One thing that we've been really careful about is to not actually have opinions that are related to Chelsea Buckles. What we will do is we will share with you how what we can and cannot do, system limitations, what is required, but we are in our jobs, what we need to do is basically be anti-emotional. Like, uh, uh, if you want to know Chelsea Buckholtz's opinion, I'm happy to tell it to you, but that's irrelevant to your work, right? So as a state employee, we're just going to share with you the yeses and nos and the whys. Um, so I don't want you to feel worried about us kind of having any sort of personal agenda. There's no room for it, really, in our in our jobs. That's a good thing. Interrupt. No, no, no. That, and that's a good thing. Like, not having personal opinions on our end is great. Um, because it means we're not influencing things based on how we feel about something, right? Um, and so uh, Jen is also here. Jen um, can do so things similar to Denise as it relates to education examinations. I'll say both of them are also really helpful with the like, okay, this is how it actually works. Like you submit this and then we do this and that and this. The things that you probably don't think about because you just submit and then you get the thing back. But it turns out there's like a whole series things that happen in between. Um, and so really helpful resources. Uh, we've also got Mike Malloy, who is the Director of Enforcement, right? Um, and he has provided cookies for today. Um, so uh, Mike is a really great resource when it comes to all things enforcement. He can get you statistics. He can answer questions about how things work. He can tell you things that they're seeing, um, and he can also provide that other component of, well, if you do this, then it's going to mean this, this, and this. And sometimes that's okay for it to mean this, this, and this. It's just you need to know that that's, you know, because let's say we, we decide to do this thing. Okay, you could totally do that, but the reality here is that it's going to mean your license, like the time to turn around the license just went from, you know, five days to six months is that what you want to do similarly i think enforcement can certainly get that way right um so mike is here to provide that perspective um again we don't have opinions and, and mike sample deal is always here too he's got that education uh, background as well i just want you to know that we are here to serve as a resource we're not here to crush ideas it will feel like we're here to crush ideas um but we're not and um like I say, we're fun in real life, probably not fun at work. Uh, <laughs> my ideal, to be honest. Okay, so that's it. That's advisory committee training. Um, and now, let me go to my annotated agenda that I made for myself. Oh, is it election time? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's the most stressful time for the attorneys in the room. Um, so the next item is election of officers, and we're going to do it for each position. So we will take nominations for chair uh, first, um, and then we will do that vote. And then once that is done, we will do, um, I keep coming up with the wrong, I think treasurer, that's not right. A vice chair, similarly, we'll close, we'll take the vote, we'll decide who is vice chair, not be you. Um, and then we'll do secretary, right? Um, and that way, if somebody was nominated for chair but didn't get it, they could, you know, potentially end up being vice chair, et cetera. Um, so you can um, nominate yourself. You can nominate someone else, hopefully, in this time. I know this is our first meeting, but you've had some time. A lot of you seem like you know each other, but also some time to get um, – an idea of who everyone is and what the perspective they bring and what you would like um, for your chair. So the chair is going to be the one who generally runs. I know you all know this, runs the meetings. Vice chair steps in. Uh, secretary is like the surprising workhorse job where you have to review the minutes. Um, and I think people forget about that. So I am going to tell you that. And we love a very responsive secretary for when we ask uh, for review of meeting. Okay, so I... Can't wait to elect a chair who can run the rest of the meeting. Nominations are open. I'll nominate Ty for chair. Thank you, Larry. Okay, any other nominations? Anyone else interested? 
I'm interested. Okay. So we've got a second nomination for Brian Sales. Anyone else? So now we're going to take it in the order of the um, of the nominations themselves. You can see I'm looking at Abby for that. Um, also a true expert on Robert's rules. Um, okay, so we'll do a, a voice vote. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so all who... If are, you can, yeah, you can just raise your hand, including yeah. on the screen, and then we'll do a count. Yes. Oh, and I can and take we're, this off. Hold on. There were nine members. Here. Let me take this stop for... Uh, my God, y'all, my technology, you will learn this, not great. <laughs> so basically, um, we'll take a, a vote. Um, if someone receives the majority, then we'll just stop. Yeah, right. So there's, that's right. Okay, so all votes for Ty. I can vote for myself. Yeah. Okay. I'll vote for myself. One, two, Seven. Yes, seven. Yeah. Seven. Okay. So it's it is time. Now nominations for Thank Bike. You guys. I recommend Brian for Bike. Mm -hmm. And okay, we've got a, a nomination for Brian Sales. Anyone else? Okay, that makes it easy breezy. It is you, Brian. And now I've really sold the secretary position. <laughs> <laughs> Marion is uh, nominating herself. Anyone else? I nominate myself as well. Okay, Marion and Ashley. Anyone else? Okay, so we'll take Marion first. Right. Okay, so you're going to do the same thing you just did, which is a hand raise. All for Marion. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Six. So we've got, it'll be Marion. Congratulations. Congratulations. But we do this every year, so we'll be back in January and uh, Abby and I will be stressed out about it. Okay. Was that stressful? Um, no, this wasn't stressful. Sometimes it gets stressful. Um, okay. So it's Robert's rules. Um, I'm going to turn it over. This is the. <laughs> Thank you, guys. This is the very exciting part, which is that Ty is now in charge of the meeting. I'm going to go sit next to Ty because I have an annotated agenda that might assist him. <laughs> nice. And Ty, we do provide sure. you with that uh, before each before the meeting. before the yeah. meeting. Yes. As red letters in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, that's yes. what she says. Yes. Can't say what's in yeah. there. Yes, that's right. So, uh, 2024 chair takes over me running the meeting here. Um, so, for public comment. Okay. Okay, public comment with any written public comment received on non agenda items. None. Trek will let you know Answer. if folks uh, signed up. Yes, okay. you don't have to actually okay. do that part, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was great. Well, that's, you know, good. I just want to make sure they'll let you know if anyone has done it. Yes, and yeah. we don't, yes, and we don't have any. And and we are really springing this on Ty, so, um, he's, so he's being very kind. Um, okay, so the next item. Okay, discussion you. regarding possible topics to be discussed by the committee in 2024, including a review of past Roker Responsibility Working Group initiatives or recommendations. <laughs> So this is exciting. I have a Slack. <laughs> if you want to walk through um, awesome. the recommendations first, so I think I left. <laughs> At our last BRWG meeting, mm -hmm. one of our intense was okay what do we want to say to the committee right in january when they start here's the things that we're recommending that maybe we discuss or talk about and, and move forward not all inclusive it's just some recommendations yeah was, that's right it was like a note to your your future committee so what i did is i took um the recommendations from the minutes of the last meeting um some not verbatim but the gist of it. I've got two slides with recommendations, um, and then I put um, 
an asterisk by some, and I will explain why I did that. So as you can see, the first recommendation was for this group to examine issues look at that, in this rule, in the rule uh, related to file retention for brokers and sales agents and explore a definition of the term sensitive communication. Does one of you want to um, expand on what that conversation was just a little bit? Yes, um, and it's talking about the IABS and presenting that to consumers, an actual definition of what that is. And I think like file retention for yeah, well, brokers and agents and what needs to be in the files. And right? there's only a re there's only in the, in the file uh, retention rule. It's only for brokers, not for actual um, licensed agents. So we were talking about the discussion was to have licensed agents have to retain the information, emails, text messages, all this other good information in in line with what a broker has to do as well. So that's one of the, the items they recommended. Um, the next one is to define broker associate. A lot of conversations about broker associates um, uh, and explore regulation of broker associates, explore ways to notify brokerage of any disciplinary action against broker associates, display a broker associate brokerage affiliation on website. Um, I put an asterisk by this to let you know. Um, so this was something that was looked at during the um, last commission workshop as it relates to initiatives. So it, um, Abby and I are actually doing some of the work on this in terms of, of doing some research, getting some ideas of like where this would fill in. Um, and, you know, display on the website is, um, that's something that, like we're also looking at how how to best do that. Is that you know what, what kind of a change does that look like? So I, I let you know that to know that this is something that's like an ongoing initiative, um, and uh, just just that. So that is something that was presented. There's some interest in some of it. I think the disciplinary action part gets a little bit tricky, but we are looking at the interplays of the laws and requirements tied to that and tied in a few other things. Um. I think the the biggest discussion we all had about it, Brian, if I'm correct in speaking like this, is showing the connection with that actual brokerage, because when you look them up on on the Trek website, there's really no connection with like, say, a, a larger brokerage or a smaller brokerage or anything, and they're not actually reporting to that broker. They're an associated broker, so they're associated with that business, but there's no way for a consumer to see that. They don't really know unless they have the IABS or something else that goes back to the communication piece being defined as well. And, and it involves enforcement too. So if right. that broker associate you know, gets filed on and they have a complaint, their responsible broker does well, is not notified. Yeah, They're not notified. And so there's there you know, just became <laughs> aware of several issues there. Um, it's just transparency. Chance talked about some broker associates in his um, in his office are also associated with other brokerages and doing business, and which was news to us as well. And so it uh, there's a lot of issues around that, and and I think it's it's a worthy discussion and exploration. And and that's one that will also um, it should you guys take this one up um, provide some background on how it looks from a regulatory standpoint. Um, the, you know, a, a broker is a broker in our eyes um, from a regulatory standpoint, but we see the things that the issues that you all are raising and discussing. And so this is this is where it's landed. I can't imagine this doesn't come back to you in some way, um, even just organically. Mike, do you have I'm sorry, I need to stop. I've been. No, no, it's good. It's good. Oh, I just put it up. No, I, I see this. This is a I think this is a big issue. I see this a lot when I'm teaching classes. And I'll be telling somebody that you have to go to your broker for this. You have to do that. You have to do this. And this is the rule in that brokerage and whatever we're talking about. And invariably, every single time I'm teaching some broker associates, I'm a broker associate. I don't have to do any of that. And they do it all the time. And so I think that there's got to be some, I think I, I really support going into this because I think this is something that, that even the broker associates don't know what the rules are. If there are any. Sure. <laughs> okay, very cool. Um, and these are the last two. And then um, 
and the you know open it up for sort of the wish list. Uh, so um, explore the overall structure of broker supervision. So this was made in reference to discussion regarding a possible limit uh, of number of LLCs agents that can be supervised. I put an asterisk there. Um, so this came up a little bit at the workshop. Traditionally, um, you know, we talk about business models. Um, and the commission has has declined to go in a direction of of putting limits on such things. Um, and so, if you are interested in that conversation, you can you can look back to the it was the what, November workshop um, where this was discussed. So that's I'm not stalling the conversation. I'm letting you know what the where it's generally stood and how that's that's been considered. Um, I know we're seeing a lot of different things, so you may want to go back through that if you if this is something you want to pick up or, or think about the the ways in which you know this discussion happens. Out of that discussion, we had a, a rule change which requires a, a new agent be uh, mentored, supervised over their first three transactions of any real estate type where historically it had been on their first transaction and so it really it it raises it raises the bar for professionalism when it comes to broker responsibility and mentoring and uh, coaching and supervising agents but it really came out of you know can a can a broker who's sponsoring 1500 agents really provide that level of supervision and you know where where are the where's the role of the designated supervisor or manager and, and how does that play out? Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. And I think the other thing is we've see, uh, there is a trend for, um, certain brokers to find that creating LLCs and, uh, I won't identify anybody. I just say it, uh, but creating LLCs and then having agents be the owner of that LLC and then, Kind of going off and doing their thing uh just the oversight for those items and um making sure that you know we're all playing on the same field basically uh, i guess that's the best way to say it we also had discussion about back to the designated supervisor who, who do they supervise mm -hmm. or if you're looking at an agent they have a designated supervisor unless you have their iabs there's really no reference to who who's supervising them. Right. And so from a consumer standpoint, how do I get to the boss? You know, and, and so that was around that. By the way, I think the rule change on allowing LLCs to receive compensation, right on. Yep. Yeah. Okay, and then the last one, and this one is definitely coming your way, I will say. Um, is to review the BRWG's past recommendation regarding broker experience and education as part of the BRAC's future work related to a possible change to education and experience hours required for a broker license. So Brian talked about this a little bit. There's a statutory change where um, Trek had rulemaking authority as it relates to determining active experience, um, but the, the number of education hours was locked in statute. There's legislative change that has now um, given Trek the authority to um, determine those education hours and rule with a cap at 60, which is what it currently is. Um, and, and you can break that down by all the semester hours and Jen always has to help me with that. But I would say the cap um, in, in, the, in the new legislation capped it that it's not going to go over what it is right now. Um, but it does have the potential to to change. And the thought behind that, um, and a lot of this comes out of the work of this group and past iterations of this group is, OK, well, where is the toggle? Um, I think we all know experience does a lot for you. Right. I would say when I graduated law school, like, I didn't know how to be a lawyer. Um, I knew some things, but I didn't know how to be a lawyer. Um, and some might argue that's still ongoing. Um, but. <laughs> But what is the experience component? How do you, if you're going to lower education and raise experience, is everything fine? It might be that everything's fine. Um, we're not going to raise the education because we're capped at 60 and that's what we're at. But those are going to be the discussions um, happening with this group. And when you look at rulemaking authority, this is why this is such a benefit is um, instead of it being a, a legislative change that, you know, it's got it, we've got to see if the legislature wants to make that change, et cetera. 
Now we've got um, a more nimble process so that if the toggle is wrong, let's say there's a change and it's wrong and it's resulting in you know a lot of things, we can look at it as a commission, put some rules out. It also allows for a lot more stakeholder input because of that public comment period. And I can assure you there will be a lot of public comments on this, right? right. It's a big deal. Um, but this is, I think, 100%. Uh, this is the, probably the, the real big conversation that this group will be having. It's why I joined the work group five years ago, mm -hmm. because I just got my broker's license without a, without a bachelor's degree. And so the requirement for me was 900 plus hours of real estate related um, education. And my partner and my sweet wife has a bachelor's degree in nursing home administration. And she was automatically awarded 600 hours and she then needed 300 hours of real estate related education. And I just saw an unlevel playing field with a, a really at home example. And then, and so how do we, how do we level that playing field? which I think is, is important work. And then we had a lot of discussion about the value of it, uh, of experience. While I'm obtaining my 900 hours of real estate related education, I also obtained 50,000 experience points. Yeah. And I only needed 3,200 at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And so we had discussion, can I, can, I, can I swap some of that experience for required education? So, um, that that change in statutory to rulemaking really gives us an opportunity to address those issues and I think do good work. It's such a long time coming to if there's a single change that the commission ultimately can make through a rule that like automatically has confetti drop from the ceiling. Like, <laughs> yeah. This is it, yeah. yeah, I think people exactly. have been waiting for it and it's been something <clears throat> that that we we've, we've been working towards for a long time. It has been a long time. It's taken a long time. 100% agree. So those are the ones that came out um, from from the last from the BRWG um, and the the thought behind this agenda item we put it on inspector committee to um, is uh, for this group to be able to um, talk about other things that you might want to add to your list. This doesn't have to be the list, but just to start having and, and probably ties back to why did you you know. What what is a thing that you are hoping to work on while you're here, et cetera? So um, I'm turning it to Ty. I'm really good at that. Ty. Would we like to add anything else uh, to the agenda as far as topics you would like to discuss? Is that a good? Yeah, it can be for the agenda or it can also just be for the year. For the and year. Pick yeah. some to go on the agenda for the next one, the if, next meeting. If anybody would like to say something that they would like to have added or spoken about? Mike? Mike? Uh, succession brokers. And I've had this discussion with various members of the commission and, and various chairs over the years. And I've had personal experience because I went through one when my best friend got brain tumor. And I think that we need to, it, it's a very difficult thing to get accomplished at a time when a brokerage is really lost. Uh, mm -hmm. when somebody dies or gets seriously ill and it's not going to be able to continue. And I th I would like to discuss the option of maybe putting a succession broker in place before that person is needed. I understand, you know, that can change over time and all that kind of stuff. But I think that having somebody in that position will make the uh, transition much easier and more seamless. The, the agents are petrified that they're not going to have a place to work. And, you know, the, the brokerage family has issues with what's going on in the middle of this. And I think if we have some kind of just doesn't have to be perfect, but it just has to be something in place. Because I see every once in a while when I talk to people about this, they say, well, we don't ask because we don't want to know because we don't want to make everybody inactive until they have a chance to get that done. And, I, and it's a process. So right. so I think that I think I'd like to add that sometime during the year. So. That's a good one, Mike. That's a commission initiative. Uh, that they, the commission uh, takes up initiatives every other year and that broker succession is one and it makes sense for it to land here as well. Um, Mary? Um, when I was coming off of ESEC, we were looking at the broker responsibility educational content. So we've already addressed kind of what does it look like to become a broker, mm -hmm. but more so when you are a broker, 
what does that look like when it comes to educational requirements? I know we were reviewing some of the content to see what made mm -hmm. sense and what did make sense, but I think we can all agree once they become a broker, there's a huge educational black hole yeah. to where um, at the Texas Realtors Conference last year, these brokers were just almost crying, saying, we need help. We don't understand what we're supposed to do now. We have broker responsibility out there, the training, six-hour broker mm -hmm. educational training. But, you know, just take taking a look at that. And, and again, Jennifer could probably shed some light on where that landed because I was coming off of that. But I know we were really trying to take a look at that. Right. And the ESAC committee and the commission recently adopted changes to the 30-hour real estate brokerage course that really um, speak to that relationship requirement and responsibilities. So we hope to see that, you know, have have a positive impact on it's It's really centered a little more now on the responsibilities that the broker has to a sales agent and the expectations <laughs> a sales agent should have with their broker. So hopefully that, you know, we hope that that's at least one way of trying to fill that gap. Yeah, that's good. You know, while it's you're talking about ongoing education, once you become a broker, mm -hmm. one of our discussions was the broker responsibility course isn't required of a broker mm -hmm. until after they become a broker. That's right. right. You know, that's and right. so I become a broker and now I've got two years to learn what uh, my responsibility is. Right. So um, and then even after they become a broker, if they wait until their license expires, then that's two more years that they've gone what we call riding dirty because they don't know any <laughs> of the laws or the rules yeah. of anything. So yes, that's a that. huge right. concern, and I think it right. can really create a lot. It, it has and will continue to create a lot of consumer harm if these individuals are running businesses and doing business and they don't know how. Good point. Well, right. another initiative is to have the 30-hour real estate brokerage course <clears throat> be a requirement for SAE. So even if you're not... Um, even if you're not becoming a broker, you're still, at least in those first two years of being a sales agent, <coughs> required to take that real estate brokerage course. I was going to say, to piggyback on what you're saying, the, I had a discussion with some people recently, and they all said, why don't we just make broker responsibility course, you know, part of the CE or continuing education, what have you. And I think that really may handle the issue because at least you mm -hmm. can get it right up front and we can integrate some of that stuff in there. I think that's a great thing. Yeah. I think that yeah. is a great idea, and yeah. I think that it would also help because sometimes we have independent contractors that want to really express their independence. Yes. I think they don't have to comply. Yeah, right. Exactly. For sure. Well, and when you go back to the LLC pro um, problem that we have where you've got agents who are opening brokerages, who are operating full brokerages, mm -hmm. yes, they have a broker of record. Yeah. But, again, we know that there's a, a huge uh, problem when it comes to knowledge and education and wisdom with a lot of brokers because some of them just grandfathered in and once you become a broker you just kind of get broken more broken <laughs> more broken and further and further away from education um, so i think really tr trying to marry some of that stuff that ESAC mm -hmm. did with this group will save us a lot of time but it'll also help us really close in some loopholes it, it goes back to that discussion about the designated supervisor and what really what is that and what role is is that and how do we how do we, is that something that we put a little more teeth into mm -hmm. so we can add that we can't actually get into like a full blown discussion i mean yeah right. just because it's not on the agenda but we right. can add that as a yeah awesome yeah what i yeah. wanted to add was uh you know you have to see where how does somebody become a broker right the way most of them do is they look at okay how many years have i been in the business now oh i have enough hours i have enough transactions let me apply for my broker's license that's the that's the way that most agents become brokers is they have the qualifications and they know having the broker designation after their name is the most powerful designation they can have that's right. and that's all they look at <laughs> um so to me um, something that we've done that's been really helpful um, because we had a little bit of a problem with our certified mentor program within our company. Um, a lot of issues with lack of communication and lack of accountability. Um, so anybody wanting that, that kind of led into that leadership role of wanting to become a certified mentor, we're requiring them 
as it is our company policy to take the broker course. <laughs> so um, that's that's kind of I thought it's a great place to start. It, it doesn't solve everything, but it's a place to start. I'm going to piggyback on what you're saying. I really like that. That's a really good setup, and that's what we do as well. I think it's the smartest way to go. It's more education is always best. Um, but this is another topic that was brought to my attention. I never had thought about it. But talking about having supervisors, because you know as a team lead, you need to be a supervisor, right? The, the broker needs to certify you. That and mentorship. Um, and I think it goes along with experience and the time you spent in the business and doing actual transactions and working things and all that. What about looking at, and this is just something that was thrown out there, uh, looking at the actual time frame in which somebody can be a supervisor, maybe if they're in their first two years, is that appropriate for them to be a supervisor? And I don't know what that looks like, but that was a, a question that was brought up to me. And I said, you know, that's actually a, a very valid point. Should they be mentoring and leading other agents if, quite <laughs> frankly, they don't even know what they're doing? Or building it. Or I building mean, a team. It yeah. It does. Yeah, it's all about the experience. And that could honestly impact the team uh, piece of the business quite a bit um, by not allowing or looking into not allowing anybody with uh, not completing their first two year renewal to be a supervisor or um, impacting that based on something else. But th that was just something that was brought up to me and I thought that was an interesting comment. So I, I made a note of it and wanted to bring it to everyone's attention. I think we could throw the word sponsorship in there, same, same sentence. You know, Absolutely. technically, the minute they get a broker's license, they can sponsor 200 agents if they want to. Who cares? And that's the same problem. They have no idea what they're doing because they've never done anything like that before. So maybe that's that would be a different angle to take it, is that you right. can't get into sponsorship for so long. It, well, Mike, we also talked about, um, I know that the last group, we actually discussed the broker responsibility course, and we thought it was kind of interesting that... Um, it was not required before you get your broker's license, only right. required to renew your broker's license. And that was something that we brought up too. So we had a lot of discussion around the difference between a broker <laughs> and a sponsoring. Yes. And the difficulties in, in trying to accomplish something like creating a new mm -hmm. license type. Um, and, and but it's an issue. We didn't solve it, yeah. but it's an issue. Uh, I is. really like the idea of pathway to broker. Um, or pathway to designated supervisor. And again, it's I don't think we I don't think we have enough teeth around that uh, designated designated supervisor. I 100% I, I agree. And actually thinking about it, it does make sense. Uh, and it is a consumer protection issue, quite frankly. The other one that was brought up to my attention, I'll just go ahead and throw it out there. But the other thing that was brought up to my attention that I thought was kind of interesting is folks that are just continually just staying inactive their license continually staying inactive and um you know they're doing their ce courses to renew their license and things of this nature but i recently went scuba diving and i'm going to bring it kind of full circle i went scuba diving and there was a guy who's in uh my little uh dive team that was going and he's like look i haven't been diving for seven months eight months now but I should be just fine. And they were like, absolutely not, because you will forget the little nuances and you can, you can impact yourself, you know, and impact the team, impact the dive. So we're going to require you to take a refresher course. And this refresher course is kind of like getting you up to speed with what's going on right now. And if there's anything's changes changed since you went last, you, you went diving last, you'll, you'll catch up on it. I think that the CE thing is really important for them to continue if they're going to stay inactive, but maybe it should be something we look at as, I mean, I don't know that this could happen, but I'm just throwing it out there, a refresher uh, or maybe even suggesting a refresher CE course that could be available for someone who's been inactive um, for some time to help them get more up to speed on what's going on in the industry. So inactive to active. Yes. Okay, yes. so it's like, and I'm, I'm not gonna get into the details of this because they're not a death mm -hmm. items, right? But it sounds like you want to talk about delegated supervisors. Yes. 
or designated yeah. delegated supervisors. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you want to talk about broker responsibility course and uh, sponsoring brokers generally, right? What that looks like. Um, and then the third was, I'm looking at your notes. I've got uh, a bunch on here, so you'll have to sort through. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, but the main thing is, is it looking at um, inactive. inactive going to active status? Yeah. And how does that look? And do they really, are they really competent to go back active over a two year time frame or a year time frame or whatever that time frame is? Okay, so we'll look, so we'll just call that inactive to active. Um, without taking right you don't want to take a position right now um, right. so so we're just getting some some thoughts and i can already tell you like i can see brains being like oh but there's a thing and there's a this right. and that's touch joy and you know all that don't worry we'll get to do that um but that seems like the takeaways from those those three topics right right okay. and, and should there be a i'll add this as the icing on the cake should there be a break it since you're inactive would that mean that there's a break in your tenure as being a licensed agent as far as uh, your broker's license concerned when you go to apply? Should it impact that? I'm throwing that question out there. Well, there's the active component. I, I yes. can answer that question. That is a requirement for the broker license. <laughs> four years of active as a license holder. Is that cut like continuous? Within the previous five. Five years. Okay. And that's part of why that's not an automated process. Someone's actually going in and checking. On checking. The okay, they are checking. Um, it is someone with a certain level of expertise on the licensing team to go through and look at that history and confirm that the active was active for the last four or five years. Got that's it. why we have to. I love it. Thank you. You <laughs> just solved one of our issues now. already. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What do you got, Marvin? Well, I'll tell you what I've got, and that is. Uh, the ever popular topic of wholesaling, which over the last two years has been just yes, you know, a lot of time, a lot of effort. And at Chelsea's point, um, a lot of data was sought and input was requested. And from what I understand, there's kind of a lack of, of data there. And so um, I'm curious, you know, I think there are some brokers that don't truly understand the business model mm -hmm. and the uh their role in that process. And so is there further work that we could do on educating brokers on the whole process? Uh, there's a there's a misunderstanding, uh, I think, in the marketplace of license holders and brokers who don't really <laughs> understand it. And so I'm just, good, you know, it's good we have this, the disclosures now, which is great, very good step. I'm just curious about future monitoring of that that topic to just see if there is something that may may show up in the future that we need to address on that topic. It involves unlicensed activity, right? More yeah. wholesalers. So. One more. Go wholesaling. Ahead. Wholesaling. So I brought this up years ago on ASAC and it was kind of like, go away. <laughs> <laughs> Destruction is a beast that even with a realtor is harming our consumers beyond anything we can imagine. And no one oversees it, no one controls it. And new construction is one of the areas where I think if ever we need more and more policy and procedures or some oversight, because you can do education all day long, but mm. when the contracts are controlled by the builder and everything is controlled by the builder and the consumers are losing money losing time, losing homes, all of that. So mm -hmm. I remember someone saying, well, we, we tried to get that to the governor's desk and it kind of went on deaf's ears. But I think enough data is out there to show that consumers are truly being harmed. The news stories are there. So, you know, I'd like to bring that back up again. And new construction. That yeah, is, uh, I remember. I remember when we were doing a ton of sales like that, we'd go into the builder's office and how many times do they say, no, if you've got an agent in tow, then it's going to cost you this if you get rid of the agent. So that's a downright absolute problem for the consumer because they lose the right to be represented. And so then everything is in the builder's side. But boy, that's going to be a tough for the developers got a lot of power in this state. <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah, wholesaling, yeah. 
I think at one time there was a regulatory agency for yeah, builders right. and that went away. TRC and so there's there's no oversight. Right. Yeah, it never West. got any legs. I mean, it yeah. was there, but. And right now that's the number one place to get a house for people right. because right. there's no inventory. And it's going to be right. for, for a, a while. decade. Yeah. And Mike, you know, uh, just talking about that as well. What about equitable? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll say this. Marvin actually brought up a good point on the wholesale side. Equitable interest. And what happens if a license holder is buying equitable interest? So acting as a wholesaler? Well, they're not acting as a wholesaler. They're acting as a purchaser of the property from the wholesaler. That so happens. final. That, that happens quite often, actually. So they are the final purchaser. They're buying the equitable interest. So is are they required to disclose? And how does that look? Okay, I want to make sure I understand what this means. Uh -huh. I slow. They're buying the contract. They're the wholesaler. So they are the wholesaler. They're not they're the wholesaler. They're the, they're, the wholesaler. From the they're the actual purchaser. Oh, they're the purchaser side. Okay. But they're not purchasing land. So it's almost like a secondary wholesaler. So basically, so like, let's just say. Yeah, tell Marvin, me the story. Marvin's selling his house. I go in and negotiate it. I'm an agent. I go and negotiate to list it. You're the buyer's agent. You put under contract with your client. And let's just say it's Abby. Abby's your client. You put under contract. Abby turns out, she turns into a wholesaler and she says, hey, I'm going to sell my equitable interest in this contract. Mm -hmm. We're really just here just wanting the deal to get done, helping the seller, helping the buyer. But all of a sudden she turns around and sells it to Brian. And Brian's a license holder. He's like, hey, I think this would be a great house. I can maybe turn around and do something with. But Brian's not buying the house. Technically, he's buying the contract. It's a very interesting thing that we're seeing happen yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the wholesaling right takes two. Yes. yes. Or three. And then sometimes yeah. three or four. Yeah. And, and the you problem is you mind if I jump in here? Yeah, go ahead, Chance. Okay, so number one, and I'm not an attorney. Abby could speak to this better than I could, but there's not a contract that exists in the state of Texas that isn't assignable, right? When you right. have right to the contract, you have right to the contract. Um, but I think that this poses a bigger, and I think you know Vanessa kind of talked about this earlier, is when you look at stakeholders in general, and I'm not going to give an opinion on this issue one way or the other, I just want you to keep in mind, when we talk about stakeholders in general, when you look at regulating something that a home builder does, for example, what you're really doing is regulating for sale by owner. And so there's a slippery slope between when you talk about regulations that affect one party and how they might affect other parties. Because right now, home builders are, they're the seller, right? Now they may have a licensed broker representing them and that licensed broker may have rules that that person has to follow. But at the end of the day, the principle here is what matters. And so just from a commission standpoint, when you think big picture here as you begin this group, it's super important to remember that when we talk about this type of person or this type of person, this type of license or that type of license, we're looking at a big picture and how it could affect every single stakeholder that exists in the state of Texas. That's all. Good stuff. Thank you, Chance. Does this make sense? What I was saying as well? Any? It's, 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 it's wholesaling, but it is it's a weird it's something weird we've been seeing come through. Wholesaling on steroids. Wow. Yes, yeah. it's very yeah. strange. Uh, yeah, anybody else uh, have any anything they'd like to bring up as a possible topic? It's not the end all be all. You know, I think my only thing would be just adding to the, you know, the LLC, paying the LLC is just maybe some language around how we're paying them. And are they, you know, is the requirement that there's only one person that's got 51% and everybody else in the LLC can be an unlicensed and then we're still paying a commission. So I know that's going to be probably an ongoing topic for a long time. I think it's a great rule change, by the way, but probably just some more language around for the commission around that. Perfect. Thank you, Larry. I think that's a good point. I just made a note of it as well. And it's a question that's been coming around through our brokerage as well. 
and uh, Chance's video helped everyone understand it more. <laughs> I can say that for sure. Um, but the truth is, is that I think it's going to be a continual issue and a lot of questions for it, uh, at least over the year to come. It's new. Yeah. And I mean, we're we're seeing things that we're like, we did not, you know, I didn't think about <laughs> yeah. that. OK, um, because that's what happens when you're implementing. I mean, it's a legislative change and it's all new and we're. It's good to hear the questions. It's good to see what's happening um, and the like sort of the things that you can't predict everything. So some of the scenarios that, you know, are given to you, you're like, oh, OK, that was not one that I think was probably on people's minds. Um, but it's helpful to have these conversations about that process and what you're seeing out there and things like that. Anything else we'd like to just kind of throw out there? I've hit all my topics on here that um, I thought were relevant. So, um, Vanessa? Me? Vanessa, can What's we our next step? Step the strike stack? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Yes, of course. Just um, we'll make sure we communicate with the right person. Absolutely. And uh, we can also help you with that. If you reach out to Vanessa, reach out to me, we can get you to, you don't have to guess. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> we can help you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, you, so I think that so agenda item eight is um, future agenda items for commission and then the meeting dates for the next meeting. Um, meeting dates is probably an easier place to start, one would think. Uh, it, but really, what you want to do is on future agenda items, I think you want to take one or two of those. Um, for the next meeting, right? Because if you fill up your whole agenda, that it's not gonna, it doesn't work. We found that it works well to have one or two of those bigger items. So, you know. Do we want to? Do we want to take a look at since we've done a lot of work on this in the past? Do we want to take a, a look at the broker licensing um, stuff that we've already kind Ed of education and educational experience requirements? requirements? Yeah, I, I would. Let's start off right. That's start off with right a big one. Yeah. yeah. Everybody agree? Um, okay. So let's let's add that one to it. Let's look at the overall licensing and experience requirements for brokers. Okay. Um, and then yeah, I think we should add one more. That one's going to be a. I think the other. Um, issue that's got a lot of opportunity for improvement discussion is around associate brokers um their role um associate brokers slash delegated supervisor i mean those are two two separate topics but um i think we should i think we should go down the road on associate brokers associate brokers add that to the mix yeah you said you were you guys were working on some things with that one. Yeah, and we might have some some information to provide at that point because that's useful. So okay, so let's add that add that one to the mix as well. And then In, those are your suggested dates. Okay, suggested dates for future meetings uh, would be Wednesday, April twenty fourth, twenty twenty four. An alternate date would be Tuesday, twenty twenty three. Um, I mean, uh, Tuesday, April 23rd, 2024, or Thursday, April 25th, 2024, or 24, 25th, 2024. Mm -hmm. Golly, this is I like crazy. Wednesday the 24th. I like I Wednesday too. too. It's a good day. Are we good with that? Yeah. Works for me. I'm moving Portland, but that's fine. Not a problem. I'm in Ohio. Mike, would you uh, would you rather look at the alternate? No, I can do that. I've got I've got an appointment each day, so I can move that one the fastest. So. Okay. <laughs> You can't. That makes it easy. So. You, you remote. Okay. I'll, 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 yeah, I'll, I hate remote. <laughs> that's works for everybody. I'll make it work for me. Where are you going to be? Ohio. Oh, nice. Okay. No, not nice. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll figure that well, out. I'll, I'll, uh, so I'm, I guess not, I'm sorry. I'm not able to make it that day either. On the 24th? Yeah. Okay. Let's look at um, what day would be better. Either. 20, uh, I can do the, the for me it would be Wednesday or Thursday the 25th. I would agree. I cannot do the 25th. You can't do the 25th. About the 23rd. The 23rd. The Tuesday. Tuesday. Anybody have any issues on the 23rd? I do. I'm I'm away at a conference. 
Uh oh. So we're we're gonna miss somebody. Yeah. Which day, which uh, which somebody are we gonna miss, guys? With the, the critical mass. Well, yeah. What, what were you? Okay. How many people could not make the? What was it? The twenty, the twenty uh, fourth. If you got raise your hand. If you, if you can't do the twenty fourth, it looks like we've got Marion and Ashley. Is that right? And then for the twenty third, who could not make the twenty third? Ashley. Okay. And who could not make the twenty fifth? Marvin and Ashley. Okay. I have a problem today. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like the, the 23rd is 23rd. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. And you do always have a virtual um, option with this group. Yeah. And so, we just have scheduling conflicts. This is just normal life. It's yes, okay. I agree. <laughs> well, and I might be able to adjust some of the conference. I mean, we'll see. Yeah, I'll choose priorities. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's um, let's say that April 23rd then is the the date of the meeting. And um, with that being said, let's adjourn. Let's adjourn this meeting and okay. let's say it's a successful first meeting. And happy New Year. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning. Happy New Year. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. See you guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank bye you. Bye, guys. Bye, bye.